woke up this morning with my mind one more time. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Barbara, for that selection. <laughs> we want to welcome you to the North Carolina NAACP Fall Together Mar Movement kickoff. Somebody say kickoff. Kickoff. Yes, we're going to kick off the Mar March to the polls around the state. Also, we're commemorating the 1963 March on Washington, originally known as the March for Jobs and Freedom. Yeah. Right. Amen. 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 And I want to know how many of y'all are familiar with America's Journey for Justice yeah. with the NAACP from Selma, Alabama to Washington, D.C. In fact, the delegation came through North Carolina, they crossed the North Carolina state line on August 29th. Right. Amen. So we are here. And unfortunately, I know some of you got the news that we had one of our lead marchers who carried the flag, a veteran, who was willing to put it all on the line as he marched. And he lost his life marching for justice. And I can't think of a better way to go. But middle passage is what we call them. And so we want to keep him in mind too as we think about this great evening and what we're about to do. I want to, is Reverend Brian Crisp, is he ready? We want to give him a big hand as he come because let me tell you, we first want to thank uh, Sister Nancy, Dr. Nancy Petty, for opening up her doors, but she also, amen, but she also has great people around her, and we want to bring forward the community uh, ministry coordinator and interim youth pastor for Pullman Memorial Baptist Church, my dear brother, Reverend Brian Chris. God bless you. On behalf, uh, on behalf of uh, Reverend Nancy Petty, I would like to welcome you to Pullman Memorial Baptist Church. You may know a little bit about this church where we strive to walk humbly as we embrace compassion and work for justice. We are a church with a strong history where a cloud of witnesses has worked toward racial equality, inclusion of the LBGTQIA community, and a fair treatment for those who labor in field and factory. We can trace our history to the great prophets such as W.W. Finlater, the champion who spoke out against segregation, and John T. Pullen, who advocated for human rights for those in the reconstructed South who were told they were not human. We can trace our history back further to Anne Hutchinson, the brave woman in the Massachusetts Bay Colony who said women had the right to interpret sacred text. We can trace our faith back even further to John Smith, who proclaimed God could not be confined to the monarchs of England. Yet, we can go further back to Brother Jesus, Palestinian Jew living in a Roman occupied Near East who said, worth, the worth of people extended beyond the definition of the Pax Romana. We can go further back 
to the 8th century prophets who were searching for a way to be in a divine community where men and children and orphans and strangers were given divine dignity. We can go even further back to the land of paradise where Yahweh, the divine creator, sculpted and molded plants and beasts and all humans and declared it good. This is a place that rests on those shoulders. This is a place that links arms with those saints. And this is a place that marches for all people to have love and dignity. So to all of you, with great warmth and great power, I say, you are welcome here. This is for the most part an organizer's meeting, amen? amen. So what we're going to do, uh, as the North Carolina NAACP State Conference with several branches around the state, we are in the home, we're on the back door or in the front door of two of our branch presidents and representatives who are here tonight. So first we're going to hear a welcome from the president of the Wendell Wake NAACP Mr. Charles Upchurch, and then following him, we're going to have a prayer, and who will also bring on your special treat for tonight, our leader, Reverend Barbara. Uh, Dr. Rochelle, uh, Dr. Portia Rochelle will come with a prayer, and then we will move right along, and after Reverend Barbara, we're going to get down to some organizing. Amen? Amen. So after, uh, now we can come forward, uh, Mr. Upchurch. Let's give him a big hand as he comes. God bless you. Hard working. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I am Charles Upchurch. I'm president of the Wendell Wake County and WACP. Your welcome has already been extended. He gave the welcome, but I just want to welcome you to Wake County, and this is a huge endeavor for us partners, and we welcome all partners that partner with the NAACP on this journey for justice. We welcome you here, Raleigh, Wake County. Look, just come. And, 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 and uh, anything that you want to know about this place, you ask somebody. You're welcome. Good evening. Fired up? All right, ready to go. Let us come together, all hearts and minds, as we pray. God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for being an almighty God, a God that looks beyond our faults and meets our needs. We come before you tonight, God, giving you thanks for giving us the strength, the motivation to carry out this movement. God, our motto is it's our time, it's our vote. That is our battle cry. We call on to you, God, to continue to be our strong tower. Some of us get weak along the journey, but tonight we come to be refueled and restored. We're coming to the well, thirsty. Fill us, God. Quench our thirst with the word. We're coming, God, to be renewed. You are a mighty God and an awesome God. And we know you can do anything but fail. Some have been busy on this journey. We ask you to continue to strengthen God, lead, and direct them. Some have been sitting along the wayside. So tonight, God, we come to motivate them. Encourage them to no longer be silent, to no longer sit on the sidelines, but to be activated, to pick, take a part in this move. We need everyone, every age, to get involved in the voting rights movement. It is a necessity, God, that we wake up, shake up one another, Encourage one another to get involved. Take on the task at hand. God, as we leave this place, 
Let us not leave discouraged, but encouraged. And we have leave this place, God, that we will leave as eagles that will soar, that will not faint, that will last throughout this journey. Hallelujah, God. We're depending on you. We're depending on you, God, to bring us together in unison to carry out this movement. Those that have lost their spark, God, rekindle that fight, that warring spirit in them, God, that they will join this movement and walk out of this place as mighty soldiers, ready for battle, knowing that we shall not be defeated. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Amen. Tonight I have the privilege to bring before you the architect of the North Carolina State Conference Moral Movement. None other than Reverend William J. Barber II. If I were to describe him in one or two minutes, I would say B stands for bold. A stands for awesome. R stands for renowned, especially after the speech in Philadelphia. The B stands for bright. Isn't he brilliant? Yes. To, 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 to a working man, he doesn't just give orders like some leaders. He gives orders, he follows through, and he joins us in the movement. He doesn't sit back and get all the credit, and we do all the work. He involves everyone. R stands for right on time. Right on time. I present to you this evening, Reverend William J. Barber II. Forward together. Forward together. So we gather here tonight. I'm so thankful. I want to do a couple of things before I say anything. The members of the media, immediately after I make this statement, I'm going to invite all clergy here to go out with me and we'll talk with you um, as the meeting continues. Um, I ask your prayers. I had a very dear friend to suddenly die this week, a uh, young man, and had to ju I've just left doing his eulogy uh, in Goldsboro. And last night we were on the road. We had um, in this moral revival that's moving around the country that started at Temple Beth Or. We had um, more than a thousand people that were there in Washington, D.C. and and Rabbi Dean, ever since we left Temple Beth Or, uh, the crowds have been literally overrunning, so much so that people can't get in and lines are around the corner. Uh, <laughs> something's happening. <laughs> something's ha is this mic on? Can we turn? Thank you. Yeah, can you all hear me? Yeah. Uh, so something is happening. Uh, I want to ask, first of all, where are all our organizers? Because the organizers don't want y'all, the one, well, Democracy in North Carolina and the ones that work, y'all stand up, the organizers. Where are you? Because we need you. Okay. Where's, brother? Where, where, no, the, like the ones that are hired. Y'all know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> <laughs> Democracy in North Carolina and the NAACP Souls Opposed Consultants and Voter Registration with Donna. Okay. I need all y'all to come up here on the mourner's bench. Exactly because we, we got to do some work. And first work, I want everybody to have a church fan. So y'all grab, get with Marcus. Everybody, everybody should have a church fan. Now, now you, don't, we, we're getting these not for you to just have one, but you're going to get them to take with you because these got information on them. And everybody that's got a placard, hold it up. Hold it up. Yeah, a placard. There we go. There we go. Hold them up. All of these you get, you're going to take with you tonight. 
I've asked Laura Ashton, who's our leader, lead on our voting uh, organizing on the NAACP side, and Marcus on the Democracy in North Carolina, and Reverend Gatewood, who's serving as our field, um, uh, field director uh, for the state NAACP, and, and joining that with the HK on J organizing, uh, coalition organizer, as we need everybody, all hands on deck. My, my job tonight is to tell you why we are deputizing and making everybody here an ambassador tonight. You didn't come tonight uh, just to hear somebody talk and go back. The question here tonight is not are you registered. We just assume everybody here is already registered. In, in fact, there's one sister here, Mary Perry's daughter, she's already voted because in, in Florida, They've already voted. Stand up. She's already voted. She, all right. Huh? Absentee. Uh, Ger she, no, she's from, uh, she, uh, she, don't, she ain't from Germany. She's in Florida. But from North Carolina. From, that's very fast that she, but her residency is in Florida and she voted absentee. So I'm assuming everybody here is all, but now we're being deputized. Now, you know in the moral Monday, Movement, and, but we never speak alone. I try never to be at a podium because a movement is not about one person. We've been in a three year battle with the plaintiff stand up Miss Mary Perry, Miss Rosanelle Eaton, <laughs> Dr. Mendez in the church. Remember Miss Carolyn Q. Coleman in her absence? These people signed up, churches and individuals. And uh, I can tell this now. Miss Rosanelle told me one day we were going into the courtroom in Winston Salem, and the plaintiffs had been the people on the other side. The governor, and his team, had been drawing this thing out. She said, "They think I'm gonna die. I ain't going nowhere." <laughs> <laughs> and you did say it just like that. <laughs> yeah, she said. Uh -uh. She said. She said, "No, God got us in this," uh -huh. and she said, "And I'm gonna be right here." And she's, both her and Sister Perry and others have been so gracious. And three years, three year battle. Also today is the one year anniversary of the Journey for Justice. Uh, uh, how many was about a hundred of us? More people, at least a hundred. For who walked the Journey for Justice? Stand up, all you all that walked. All the way across. Yeah, give them a big hand. In fact, the largest gathering of the Journey for Justice from Selma to D.C. was right here in North Carolina. The largest, the largest gathering. Uh, tremendous organizing. And then um, who else? Um, and um, where's the lady that walked for me? Is she here tonight? There was one, Ruth walked all the way to D.C., I think. Ruth put people to shame. She, 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 about, she wasn't about 80. How old is Ruth? She's 90, she ain't 90, but she 80 something, but she outwalked everybody. Uh, and today, the 29th, is one day after the 53rd anniversary of the March on Washington and the 61st anniversary of the death of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was killed on August 28th, 1955. That is why they chose August 28th to be the March on Washington. And while I'm non, we are nonpartisan, but we're not non-historical. So I can say something. President Obama accepted the nomination for the Democratic Party for president on August 28th. That's just a little history. We went from the death of Emmett Till to the resurrection of President Obama all on the same day. Only the spirit of the universe could set that up. My brothers, sisters, and I want to be very serious for the media. And I want to tell you why we, you've got to accept your deputizing tonight. On June 29, 2000, July 29, 2016, the second highest court in the land found that Governor McCory and other leaders, Republican leaders of the North Carolina legislature, 
with intent. Yes. Right. Now I want to, I want you to get that because they did this in your name with your money. Yeah. They spent five million dollars, yep. almost six of your money, my money, right. to engage in intentional racial discrimination. Now they still could have been proven guilty if they had not intended, but the law was racial discriminated anyway because there's something called disparate treatment. And the, and the law doesn't require that you have to intentionally do it. You can be proven guilty if you didn't know it was going to do it, you didn't intend to do it, but it did it. <laughs> and then the courts can rule it unconstitutional. But in this case, it was intentional discrimination against African Americans and other voters of color, and thereby, against, therefore, against all of us. All right. All right. They wrote laws that they knew would have a disproportionate impact on minority voters. This is unconstitutional and illegal. Yeah. And on July the 29th, the highest court, second highest court in the land, found them guilty. All right. Unanimously. Two white judges and one African American. I want to give tonight some props to Al McShirley because what Al did for us in this fight, he kept saying to the lawyers, when there were considerations of backing up, no. You know, Al's my personal, you know, I call him like my elder on my shoulder, and sometimes he gave me counsel and wisdom, and he would always remind us, Reverend Barbara, this is a historic moment, we have to fight. And he said, you gotta understand, sometimes the, the lawyer's going to come and they're going to give you this option and they want the plea bargain. This ain't a plea bargain in time. All right. This ain't a plea bargain. So Al, we want to thank you for always, always. I like to try to, Al was the name, say he could one came up with HK on J. I called him one day and said, we ought to, have a way of gathering on Raleigh every year. He said, oh, and he came up with HK on J. But you have to have an elder in your midst. And you gotta have one that, as old folks say, ain't scared. <laughs> now, these laws were banned. When you hear the word enjoined, it means banned. Permanently in North Carolina the same day by the judge who had ruled against us. When the, when the, when the federal court uh, ruled, the three panel, then Judge Schroeder, who had ruled against us, immediately that day, in the middle of it, ban. Say ban. Ban. Now, let me read for the media too, some of the, oh, and about a week later, the courts came back and found that the redistricting was illegal. So twice, twice in less than a month, Republican Governor McCory and the Republican legislature were both found guilty of intentional discrimination in voting and in redistricting. Now, it took us three years. In fact, the second case wasn't ours. We had another case, but the evidence that came out in our case allowed this other case to be filed. That's why sometimes you file to get the evidence, all right? And, they, and these laws have been proven to be the worst in the country, the worst attempts. It came after Shelby, the Shelby decision. Well, one didn't, but the voter suppression after the Shelby decision. Now, let me read to you a couple of things from the decision. And we're being live streamed across the country and the world, so I want to read this, because I want people to understand 
what we are dealing with here and why you have to accept being deputized. This is what the court said. This is not what I said in the NAACP. This is what the court said. Said, faced with this record, mm -hmm. we can only conclude that the North Carolina General Assembly enacted the challenge provisions of the law with discriminatory intent. Yeah. That's page 11. Page 23, we hold that the challenge provisions were enacted with racially discriminatory intent in violation of the 14th Amendment. Number three, using race as a proxy for party. In other words, this wasn't a racial decision, it's just a political decision. The court said you cannot use race as a proxy for party. No, she, they said using race as a proxy for party may be an effective way to win an election, but intentionally targeting a particular racist access to the franchise because its members vote for a particular party in a predictable manner constitutes discriminant discrimination. In other words, you can't get mad because people are smart enough to vote their interests and vote for a certain party and then decide you want to discriminate against them. The court said that. Say, the court said that. The court said that. Then number four, page 39, we recognize that elections have consequences, but winning an election, remember how many times they told us, well, we got a majority. In fact, we got a super majority. The governor can't even veto it, so we're going to do what we want to do. Well, the court said that winning an election does not empower anyone in any party to engage in purposeful discrimination. And then lastly, and this is more quotes, but this one from page 46, the sequence of events and the General Assembly's eagerness to at the historic moment of Shelby's issuance rush through the legislative process, the most restrictive voting law North Carolina has seen since the era of Jim Crow bespeaks of a certain purpose. In other words, they decided once there was no longer a pre-clearance requirement after the 5-4 decision of Shelby, that they could try to take North Carolina back to the days of Jim Crow. Yeah. But after more than 1,200 of you going to jail, mm. and after more than 120 moral Mondays and actions, right. and after three years of court battles, yeah. and, out, and, and let you know, the lawyers came because you all had a movement. The lawyers saw us fighting, and they decided they wanted to get in the fight. And some of them came with their own money and their own resources. And even though it looked dark, even though they called us, you know, they said all kinds of things, called us moron, moral Monday, even though they said we were wrong, isn't it good that if you hang in there, that the race is not given to the swiftest or to the strongest, but to them that endure until the end. Now, not one step back. Now, these juries are above reproach. And the unanimous decision was written by Judge Motts. I believe she's a female, a white woman. She wrote, and, and, and what's interesting is she voted against when we first asked for a, um, um, what's that called? Injunction, a temporary injunction, you know. She voted against us, but, we, but when she saw the whole record. Now, the governor, Governor McCory, Republican governor of North Carolina. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm not going to speak ill of him personally. We don't do that. But, we, you know, see, for us, racism is not what's in your heart. It's what's in the heart of your policies. Come on. That's right. That's right. 
You see what I'm saying? That's how you judge racism. You don't, you, I, especially today, it's not whether you call me the N-word. Or, most folk are not going to do that today. Most folk. You know, and, and especially folk that are elected and whatnot. But you judge racism by, by what kind of policies you pass. And, you know, I actually, and this is serious, I actually feel sorry for a governor in the 21st century mm -hmm. that would act more like George Wallace and Lester Maddox. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's pitiful. It is pitiful. And you have all this power as governor and all you can try to figure out to do is try to discriminate against somebody. It, it, it's really a sad, shameful use of power, you know? And we love him enough as a human being to correct him, to challenge him. But once this ruling came down, our governor didn't repent. He attacked the judges. And that's right. he, he went after the judges and said, well, this is some kind of democratic conspiracy. In other words, he, was, he actually basically said that the governors were, that the judges were engaging in contempt of their own court. Now, Governor McCorry, Lord help him, is, no, I'm serious, I'm, I'm very serious about this. See, because one day history is gonna write about you. You, you gotta think about stuff like that when you're in certain position. One day, you know, I, and, and I, I don't wish bad on any human being. You know, one day history is gonna write. And if he keeps on, the history is gonna write. Here you were in the 21st century but in your mind and your actions, you were living, acting like the 19th and the, tw and the, and right. the Jim Crow era. So the governor, re governor and the other Republicans, not just him, are asking the Supreme Court now, in essence, joining our racism. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. They got a unanimous decision in the federal court, but now they're saying, look, Supreme Court, we want you to join us in our intentional racism. Yes. So that's where it sits now at the Supreme Court and we're waiting any day for a decision and it would be a travesty we believe for the Supreme Court to join with the government. But then the third thing, the Republican Party and media, I want you to hear this and, and why we're challenging it now, they sent out a letter from Woodhouse, or Woodhouse. No, 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 just, we need to really pray for him. I mean, I'm, I'm serious, y'all. When, when you have power and all you can think to do with that power is be mean and hurt people, you know, there's something wrong, something wrong, something wrong in how you view the world or something, you know. And, and, and Dr. King, that's why he once said, you can't, you know, you don't even want to get inside of that kind of hate and, 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 and it's, it's, it's really sad. So he sends this letter out to the local boards of election and tells them to enact voting procedures that meet Republican values and not the values of the Constitution and the court. Now, I thought it was their party that's always wanting to claim they're the party of Lincoln and always saying, let's read the Constitution. But they sent a letter out. And the media, everybody got a hold of it. I mean, this is not even a smoking gun. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sent the letter out, blatantly. Sent it out. And when you think about that, it's some, um, and where we, where, we've, where we are 51 years after the voting right. Now, even presidential candidate, Donald Trump, who claims he wants to help African Americans, he claims that. But, 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 but the question is, where do you stand on the issues that help African Americans? It's more than mouth, it's more than getting in front of an all white audience saying you want to help black people. And you can't claim what Abraham Lincoln did. He's dead. We want to know what you're doing. 
And what he's done is he came to the state right after this decision and upheld McCory and joined in with them and actually claimed that the ruling of the court would open up fraud, which was the same lie that they tried to use in the courts that the court said was wrong. Well, I tell you, all you gotta do when you wanna know about racism is look at the policy. Don't listen, that's not what folks say with their mouth. It don't add, I don't know what's in the heart, but I look at the policy, I can get pretty close. Yeah. The GA used that as justification for passing the worst voter suppression law. The courts rejected it. And even presidential candidate Donald Trump came to our state and basically sided with the governor and the legislature that's been found guilty of violating the Constitution, while at the same time, he's going around the country saying, I want to help black people. Now, lastly, this is a deep moral issue. This, this attack on our right to vote is, is, is morally indefensible. Isaiah 10 says, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. Anytime you rob folk of their rights or attempt to, that's morally indefensible. And the book of James says, faith without works is dead. In other words, it's not, it's not, you can talk all day that you're for equality, but if there's no works to back it up, or if your works are opposite equality, then that's wrong, and it's immoral. This attack on our voting rights is constitutionally indefensible. The 14th Amendment says every person has a right to equal protection under the law. When you engage in intentional voter discrimination, you are robbing people of their equal protection under the law. Amen. The 15th Amendment says that no state or no person can deny, watch this, deny, and sometimes you hear them saying, we're not denying the right to vote, we well, we keep reading, it doesn't just say deny. Right. It says deny or abridge. The short word for, for me where I explain a bridge is when you move the bridge <laughs> so I can't cross it and have access to what I've been promised in the Constitution. That's what it is. You, you remove the bridge. So when they, try, when they tried to take same day registration, they were trying to remove the bridge. Y'all with me? When they were trying to cut back early voting a week, knowing that 70% of African Americans used the first week of early voting, they were trying to remove the bridge. When they said you can't vote out of precincts, they were removing the bridge. When they said 16 and 17 year olds can't register, they were removing the bridge. And the Constitution says you can't abridge my right to vote. Now, there's one other thing, though, portion, and, and uh, my rabbi friends will get this. Whenever you attempt to deny people the right to vote, it is a form of idolatry, yes, <laughs> self-worship. Mm -hmm. Help, help me with my Old Testament yes. scholar. I have to have him behind me. Let me see. Now, if I mess up, you help me here. You won't. See, in order to have the right to vote, in order to have the right to vote, you must first be a citizen. In order to be a citizen, you must be a person. In our tradition, Jewish and otherwise, in order to be a person, you must be made in the image of God. Yeah. So if I attempt to deny the right to vote, I'm saying you're not a citizen, you're not a person, and you're not made in the image of God. 
you're not worthy. And that was the argument from the beginning of this country, that some people were not fully human. Some, if they didn't have property and they were white, they weren't fully human. If they were women, they weren't fully human. If they were black, they were three-fifths of a person. The whole line of discrimination down through history has turned on the issue of who is a person and who deserves citizenship. We stand tonight to say this is our land as well. We are citizens, we are persons, we are made in the image of God, and we will vote. This is our time, this is our Selma, this is our vote. Now, this is why I need you to stay here with Laurel and Reverend Gatewood and where's Marcus? Come on up here, Marcus. Marcus, because these are some of the top-notch organizers. I, I'd go to battle with them anywhere. Uh, these are organizers. I'm thinking about Gayet, Bayet Rustin. Yes, Bayet. Somebody say Bayet, but Bayet. Some people talk about Dr. King and John Lewis and all them, but if it wasn't for mm -hmm. Byatt Ruston and the crew that he put together, mm -hmm. he, was, he was gay, he was, he was a black man, he was in so many ways a, a renaissance man, but he was a coordinator, he could organize. Mm -hmm. Now our goal is to recruit 1,200 faith centers you're going to be hear about that tonight, and we need you to accept the challenge of helping us do it. We want to recruit 2,000 volunteers, free volunteers, yes. that will be on these polls and will get them folk out, and we need your help to do that. We need to register thousands of voters, and then if they don't get registered before the 20th, we need to get them to the polls. Mm -hmm. We need lines to happen on October the 20th. Yes. We're going to be fighting what these boards of elections are doing. They're getting ready to go before the state board because a lot of people are voting against the plan. So if they don't have a unanimous vote, it has to come before the state board of education. So the theme tonight, along with it's our time, it's our vote, it's our Selma, is this. We must vote now. Say that with me. We must vote now. After three years of fighting this intentional discrimination, and now that we've won the legal battle, we must vote now. Having same-day registration restored, the week of early voting restored, the ability to register 16 and 17-year-olds, we must vote now. Having a letter that we can all read from the Republican Party via their executive director calling on their members of board of elections to pass laws that reflect their values and not the values of the Constitution, we must vote now. Living in a state where people have used power to deny 500,000 people access to Medicaid expansion, 346,000 are white, 100 and some 30 some thousand are black. People who get a cut on their insurance because they got elected, and a governor who gets free health care because he got elected, we must vote now. In a state where 79% of North Carolinians want a living wage, and it took us from zero to 400 years to get to 725, we can't wait another 400 years. We must vote now. Living in a state where more money has been cut from public education than we've ever seen by Republicans or Democrats. Extremists have literally gone after teachers, gone after our students, gone after our public education. We must 
Living in a state where people would write a rule to attack the LGBTQ community, but then in that same legislation, attack living wages, and in that same legislation, uh, undermine the ability even of heterosexual to file employment discrimination cases in state court. We must in a state where people said we're going to cut taxes, but really what they did was cut taxes for the wealthy and raise taxes and fees on the working poor, we must vote. When we have leaders who have turned a blind eye to corporations polluting our water and now we have evidence that they intentionally lied to us about our drinking water and the poison in those, that water and what corporate polluters were doing, we must vote now. And whatever other reasons, that's our cry. Because it's our time, it's our vote, it's ourselves. We must vote now. And so tonight is the first moral march to the polls, and we're going all over this state. The media, September 6th, we're going to Harnett County. September the 10th, we're in Craven County. And these are regional gatherings. In other words, we're going to have multiple counties, but uh, September the 10th, we're going to Pasquatank. September 25th, New Hanover. Sunday, October 16th, Wayne County. October 22nd, Scotland County. October 24th, Marl Monday in Asheville. Tuesday, October 25th, Iredale County. Tuesday, October 25th, Cleveland County. Sunday, October 30th, Moore County. Monday, October 31st, Forsyth County. November 7th, Fayetteville. November 7th, Durham. And then November 8th, we vote on election day. That's a heavy schedule. And Portia, you're right, sometimes you do get tired. I thought about yesterday, I wasn't even born on the March on Washington. I was born tomorrow. But my parents both had education. My father was a trained clergy with two master's degrees, working on his doctorate, my mother I was a trained concert pianist, was working in the government, had a business degree. Grown people, my daddy had fought in this country for the Navy in 1947, 48, but he didn't have protected civil rights in 63. Mm -hmm. The day I was born, my daddy wasn't protected by the Civil Rights Act. My mama wasn't protected by the Voting Rights Act. My father's dead now. My mother, She's 84 years old and she still goes to work every day in the school that she desegregated. Right. She says, Mary, her goal is to make 60 years. I said, why 60 years? She said, because they didn't want me when I came here. Now I'm going to stay here as long as I want to. <laughs> right. But one day I was talking to Mama. And she began to recant. You know how people, your parents keep telling you the story over and over <laughs> about how you were born, what time it was, how my father fought the hospital because they only wanted to put on my birth certificate, Negro, and because my ancestry is also Tuscarora and Indian and white, he fought with them. I almost got arrested because fighting. He said, until they put down Negro with other descent. And she was telling me her story, our story. And then she looked at me with tears in her eyes and she said, don't y'all stop fighting. Mm -hmm. right. This is a heavy schedule to move across this state. But if all of us get together, mm -hmm. all right. we can send a shockwave mm -hmm. around the country, around the world, that in North Carolina, there's still some freedom fighters. Yeah. We are black, we are white, right. we are Asian, we are Latino, we are gay, we are straight, we are young, we are old, we are Christian, we are Muslim, we are Jews, we are people with no faith but who believe in the Constitution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are teachers, we are students, we are doctors, we are patients. And we believe that we've been born for such a time as this. Yes.
And we have decided that you will not desecrate the memory of the martyrs. The blood cries from the ground of those who died for us to have the right to vote. And to the governor and those who we pray for because you're so wrong, maybe you thought messing with our vote would divide us. But boy, did you get it wrong. You have united us. You have brought us together in ways that maybe we otherwise wouldn't be together. And we are not going backwards. We are going to turn this vote around and we're going to send a shock throughout this nation that says when you mess with the right to vote, you wake up a giant. You wake up our consciousness and we will work and vote to save the heart and the soul of this democracy. Are you ready to be organized? Are you ready to be organized? Are you ready to go to work? Forward together. God bless you. First, I just sum it up, I know it's tough, but in like 10, 15 seconds, what, why are we here tonight? What is our purpose? We're here because it's time for us to exercise our vote. We have seen this state engage in the worst voter suppression attempt since, the, since Jim Crow, and the courts have ruled against them. Now we're organized ourselves. We must vote now is our mantra cry. What you see here are moral fusion fighters, clergy of all different faiths who are coming together to, to, to exercise, mobilize, educate voters and to ensure that we have mass turnout uh, at the polls. Is this something that can be done? All persons that want to help, they can go to the NAACP website. Uh, we're signing up 1,200 faith um, centers uh, that will ensure that people are registered to vote. It's all nonpartisan. Uh, we're signing up 2,000 volunteers. This, this governor and this legislature spent more than $5 million of our own money to fight the people. This is bad for African Americans, it's bad for Latinos, it's bad for white people, it's bad for our democracy. Mm -hmm. It is immoral. That's why so many clergy, we're not even, it's not even about who you vote for. It is fundamentally undemocratic, it is undemocratic and fundamentally immoral for people in power that got in power by the vote to then use that power to undermine the vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, yeah, in North Carolina there is almost 300,000 of Latino people who can vote, mm -hmm. but less than 50% are registered to vote. So there is a small percent, right. and there is a smaller percent who goes to vote. So well, what is your message to the Latino community? The, the Latino community, we're actually organizing with the Latino community. We've joined with Democracy North Carolina. You know, we want to see everybody, but we're tired of all the hate mongering and the suggestion that people are not American because of their color, because of their religion, because of their uh, uh, the, the addiction, because of their language. Uh, those 300,000 uh, Latino voters are citizens of these United States, and it's time that they exercise their right to vote. Uh, we have fought now and turn back the laws that were attempting to undermine the right. We believe this hope the Supreme Court will, will, will stay with, with the decision. Uh, now we go to work. We go to work making sure that everybody knows, everybody knows about early voting, everybody knows about same day registration, and we want to see everybody that's eligible go to the polls and exercise your right to vote. Because there's another crowd that's betting on people not going. They, they're, 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 the reason they want to to suppress the vote is because they can't make their case in the public square and they are afraid of everybody voting. We want everybody to vote, whoever you are. Yeah, some of them, and 90, maybe 5%, think they don't go to vote because their vote is not important. They're not going to make a difference. Yeah. So, what do you think? Do you Two think things. Every, every vote yeah. make a oh, sure. We live in a place now in the South, particularly. If you register 30%, for instance, of the unregistered African-American voters and Latino voters and they voted and they joined with Latin, uh, uh, white, progressive whites, we fundamentally shift the South. Uh, if the vote wasn't important, people wouldn't be spending $6 million of your own money to stop it exactly. or to undermine it. The vote is extraordinarily important. We've had elections here where people have won by less than 100 votes per precinct. Um, so we, and that, and, and that is oftentimes uh, uh, the, the, the attempt to suppress the vote by what's said. Uh, sometimes our Latino brothers and sisters are afraid because 
you know, people put out so much uh, language about deportation, about, uh, and, they, and it's kind of a targeting. But what we're saying is citizens, stand up. Exercise your right to vote. Democracy is hard work and it's essential that the people be engaged. That's the only way we can have a, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people is when people exercise their right to vote. Forward together. Now step back. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank, Thank you. you all.